Hello and welcome to the Gifted Ed Podcast. We are your hosts, Angel Van Howe, Gifted Coordinator and SAL Facilitator. And Megan McCarthy, Social Worker. We are grateful for the opportunity to share this space with you today as we talk about the complexities of giftedness. Today's episode is part two of our series about perfectionism. Occasionally, we will be featuring teachers who have experience working with gifted students. We plan to refer to these special episodes as Voices from the Trenches. This episode, as well as our next episode, will be spotlighting three educators who work with gifted students. Experienced teachers can provide valuable insight into the struggles and challenges of perfectionism, as well as some of the strategies to help students overcome perfectionism while on their educational journey. My name is Jenny Garetto. I've been teaching for 24 years, and I teach middle school science and a high school honors biology course. There's a very wide variety of challenges and behaviors that students experience um, when they're worried about failing, about making those mistakes. Um, When we think about perfectionism, um, I certainly see a lot of what I would call healthy behaviors. Um, But those aren't the ones that we worry so much about. Um, It's those that when we start to see unhealthy behaviors in children because they're struggling, that we that we try to spend a little more time on, try to try to find some solutions to help them with that. Um, I definitely see anxiety for kids. Um, I have some children who th- that anxiety may present itself in some type of physical form. Uh, for example, I, I had a young woman who would pick at her eyelashes. Um, I've had children who you know, play with their hair a lot to the point where maybe the hair gets pulled out. So obviously that's very concerning when that anxiety morphs itself into some of those physical manifestations. I've definitely seen students who are experiencing perceived pressure from others, whether that's their peers or sometimes that's their family. So uh, maybe a child is taking a test and they're very concerned about how everyone else did uh, compared to how they did. Um, or a child may, may be doing something and they didn't do quite as well as they, they had thought they, they, they were going to or as well as they, they thought they should. And they might say something like, oh, my parents are going to kill me. <laughs> okay. And so in their mind, they're obviously very concerned about what they're doing. Um, some of the other behaviors that I've seen is sort of this, this black and white type of thinking where it's all or nothing and there's no middle ground. And so it's, it's having to reassure them that, no, this is not going to appear on your Harvard entrance exams. It is okay. Other things that I've seen for students that isn't that uncommon is a lack of coping strategies. Um, students who are so focused on the product that they're they're trying to produce, um, sometimes they can't focus on that process and they, they, they possess a lack of coping strategies when they can't do the things that they thought that they should do. Um, if you look at some of the the psychologists and the researchers who have done work on this, um, Maslow actually felt that perfectionism was a part of self-actualization. So when you think about that, self-actualization is that idea of you being happy, being satisfied, doing your best. What does that bring to mind for me? That brings to mind the idea of wanting to be perfect in some areas, and, and that's not uncommon for our gifted kids. I am Sarah Batzel. I teach second group at the Avery Coonley School. My students are seven to eight years old. I've been teaching for around 13 years. Oftentimes, gifted students struggle with making mistakes and failing because they're used to things coming easily to them. They're used to material being easy for them. And so they're not used to a lot of challenge. They're not used to not knowing the answer. And so that does present a challenge for many children. And oftentimes they freeze up or they're afraid to take a risk. They're afraid to 
if they're given a, a math word problem that is very challenging, they're afraid to begin to attempt it. They're afraid to write anything down before getting a complete sense of the process and answer in their mind first. Uh, they might be afraid to write a story or write a paragraph uh, if they don't feel they know the where they're going with it. Um, so kids do freeze up and they're afraid to start um, and they and they need some support or they might uh, start to cry or tense up at times if they if they get into that uh, feeling where they're not sure what to do. So I do see that happen with gifted children. Hello, my name's Elizabeth Roberts. I am a French teacher. Um, my students, they range in ages from four years old to 13 or 14 years old. And this is my 18th year. The The process that my students are going through of learning uh, another language, it, the, the idea of making mistakes is just kind of inherent to that process. You have to make mistakes to make progress um, in learning a language. And when the students begin, they really don't have an idea of what perfect uh, looks like. They don't, it, first of all, perfection in the language is unattainable. Even if you think about the way that you speak your native language, there are things you do not understand. There are things that you do not know how to say. And we are constantly learning new language. Language is always evolving. There's this thing called interlanguage. And part of that is is this kind of clumsy, messy um messy process and you'll you'll notice it when you when you hear people trying to learn your own language you'll notice that you know they're in our case their English is not perfect and they might have an accent and they might use the wrong um, verb form or they might struggle to come up with a word they're just trying to get their point across and that's what I want for my students is I want them I want to give them the tools to just try to kind of put things together and you know have this atmosphere where where making mistakes is is okay and it, it has to be okay or, or they won't make any progress. Cultivating a supportive classroom environment is the most foundational piece of keeping these students engaged. Getting to know your students and recognizing what drives their responses to certain tasks and challenges can be key. Here are some of the responses you might see and hear when students struggle with perfectionism. For gifted children in particular, that's where we really see a much wider spectrum than you might see with an average child because there definitely is that that spectrum of positive perfectionism that is what's driving them to succeed that's what's really making them happy that's what's helping them uh, navigate that process with with being very goal oriented um, but then on the other end of the spectrum you have those some of those unhealthy um, aspects of perfectionism where they just maybe have those lack of coping strategies. There, there's a lot of self-doubt um, and, and a lot of anxiety. And, and at the very bottom end of that spectrum is, is the idea that sometimes that perfectionism can paralyze them from actually being able to go through the process. I see children sit with a task and they may appear idle. They may appear unengaged by the task. Um, they may look off task um, and they're not working on the task that you may have presented them. So I see that. I see sometimes if it, there's a discussion or a lesson, a lack of participation uh, if, if a child is feeling those feelings of perfectionism. This does make me think about our new students who come in. We often have new students coming into our middle school, so they might be 11 years old, and their peers have had French since they were four or five or six years old. And so they're coming in with you know this deficit where their classmates are functioning um, on a certain level, and they're coming in new with little or, or no knowledge of French. And so I do, I can see them... Um, 
at least at, at the beginning of the year when they're when they're brand new, just feeling very nervous and uh, really unsure. And they have this idea that their peers are perhaps understanding everything I say. I speak a lot of French in the classroom. I, I try not to speak English with my students. So um, they have this idea that, you know, the students ar around them are understanding everything I say, where when in reality, that's that's not true. They're simply just accustomed to not understanding everything I say. I've noticed some new students come in and, you know, they just kind of have to jump in where where we're at, at the in the curriculum. And so they're asked to write a short response in writing or something. And they just kind of throw up their hands like, I have nothing to do. I can't, what do I do with this? And so, you know, I try to help them along with that and kind of show them how to, how to piece it together. But yeah, there, there can be a nervousness. There can be, um, you know, just a, a, a reluctance to participate. Um, and then, you know, every now and then I'll see a student who, who's just ready, ready to jump in and try to. So, I mean, there is a spectrum there. So, yeah, it depends on the personality of the student very much. When we can identify when and how perfectionism is holding our students back from fulfilling their potential, it's incredibly important to be able to implement strategies that will allow students to engage at a level that builds confidence. The stress and anxiety that perfectionism can trigger is extremely difficult to manage for many of our children. Here are some strategies for learning to overcome the fear of taking risks. First of all, you have to know your students. Um, so getting to know them on a personal level is certainly helpful, but I do think there are some things that you can do in the classroom as a whole. Um, so for example, I, I try to use stories for kids. I think stories are great ways for them to um, make connections with things. And so I always tell a story to my students about the biggest mistake I ever made. And so I tell them about how when I was a teenager, I... I was a waitress, and I used to get a lot of coins for tips. I mean, that was in the day before bills for, for coin, or bills for tips, right? And so I'd get all these coins, and I'd work all summer, and then at the end of the summer, I would take my coins into the bank. And so I was back in school, and I had a bunch of, of my friends in the car with me, and we drove through the drive through of the bank, and I thought, oh, I'm going to put all these coins that I rolled and deposit them into the bank. So I, I drive to the drive-thru and I start stuffing them into the little canister in the drive-thru. Put them into the, the machine to send it to the teller and I hear a thunk. Pretty soon I hear a voice over the, 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 the voice system and, and, she, and the lady says, ma'am, what did you put in the canister? And I said, well, I put a bunch of coins in the canister. I'm depositing some money. And she said, ma'am, your money is stuck. <laughs> Apparently, it was a little too heavy for the canister. Well, that's a great story and all, but what does that do with have to do with perfectionism, perfectionism and, and, and learning from your mistakes and being able to take risks? I said, I learned that now when I drive up to the drive-thru and I see the sign that says, do not put coins into the, the bank canister, I attribute that to me. And I think, wow, other people are going to benefit from my huge mistake. And so I, I tell that to students, not because I want to tell them all about my mistakes, but because there are good things that can come from making mistakes and taking a risk. What's the worst that's going to happen? Did it, did it harm me for life? No. Was I embarrassed in the moment? Yes. But... Now I can look back at it and say, other people benefited from this. Now other people won't do the same thing I did. And so trying to talk to kids, helping them understand that we're all human um, and that we, we don't necessarily have to take everything quite so personally, I think making those connections with kids are, are, is really important. Um, then there's also the more personal situations where um, you might have a child who is really starting to struggle with taking risks. Um, and that's where I think it's important to, to have those private conversations with kids and maybe set some goals with them. So um, maybe saying to the child, uh, what is one thing that, that you'd like to make a goal for this trimester? And then continuing to make connections with that child on that particular goal.
So I like to use strategies in my classroom that help all children be more comfortable with failure. And one of the strategies is to provide mini lessons about growth mindset. So read alouds, picture books, videos about growth mindset. One of my favorite books is called Your Fantastic Elastic Brain, Stretch It, Shape It by Joanna Deek. And it teaches children that your brain is like a muscle and in order to make it stronger, you have to give it challenges and you have to be comfortable with making mistakes. And so by reading books like this or Bubblegum Brain by Julia Cook, you are getting the children learning about how their brain actually works and how their brain actually grows. And so then you can talk about challenges as brain stretching opportunities rather than simply challenges. And so you'll get more buy-in from children when you're presenting a task as a brain stretching opportunity and, you know, making them understand that mistakes are part of that learning process. Um, Big Life Journal is another great resource that provides uh, podcast videos, book lists, movie lists. Um, there's a really great clip from the movie Meet the Robinsons where they're at an, the boy is at an invention convention. And I love showing this with my kids. And he creates this invention and goes to present it. But guess what? It fails. It didn't work the way he wanted. It was an epic failure. But then all the adults in the room, you know, the boy is upset, but all the adults in the room are actually thrilled because he – can learn from this mistake. And so they say, just keep moving forward and keep trying. Um, I also like to teach the children about people in the real world who experienced failure, but in the end experienced a lot of success. People like J.K. Rowling, who her initial manuscripts were rejected by publishers. People like Elon Musk, whose initial rockets blew up and failed. And these people were not failures in the end, but they were not perfect. And so helping children understand what real success and the real pathway towards success looks like, it's filled with bumps, it's filled with hurdles, it's filled with failure, and that's normal. It really helps children buy into the process and feel more comfortable. It's easy to confuse off-task behavior with perfectionism. Because their behaviors sometimes do look like they're uninterested. Um, but I think it's important to go check in with the student and ask probing questions. I think sometimes it's helpful to give them strategies. One time I took out a coin with a student who was seemed afraid to get started with a writing task. And I said, all right, let's come up with two options for how we can move the story forward. Heads, the character does this. Tails, the character does this. And let's flip it. And so we flip the coin. The decision was made. And wouldn't you know it, the child went off and was writing actively for the next, for till the end of the period, for the next 15 minutes or so of the period. He just had a hard time getting over the hurdle of what how to start and, and kind of – I think he was overthinking the whole process. And so once he just kind of had a decision, he kind of went with it and, and the ball was rolling. And so it wasn't that he wasn't interested. It wasn't that he couldn't do it. It was just getting over that initial hurdle. One of my favorite words in the classroom is yet. And we use that word a lot. Because if someone doesn't know something or if someone's not sure how to do something, we add that word yet. You don't know how to do it yet. You don't understand it yet. And that really changes the mindset of the classroom community and helps children feel more comfortable with not knowing something. Uh, I gave a math pretest the other day of concepts that I hadn't taught yet. And one of the kids came up to me and he wrote on the paper, I don't know how to do this. And he wrote yet at the end and he brought it to my attention. He said, look, Mrs. Batzel, I wrote, I don't know this yet. 
And, and, you know, he was, he, he really was mindful that he had written that word and it clearly made him feel more comfortable turning in the paper blank because he knew that I was going to teach him the concepts. He was going to learn it. He was capable of learning it. It was just a matter of yet. Yeah, I think there are a variety of factors. Um, I, uh, I had the opportunity to learn a foreign language when I was in elementary school myself. Um, I was first in first grade. Um, my mom was born in Holland, and she is a native Dutch speaker. She immigrated to Canada when she was five and then um, met my dad, who's an American, later on. Um, and so they've both been language lovers. They, they both have um, studied quite a few languages, and then my mom is, is bilingual. So when I was in first grade, my dad uh, had a sabbatical year. He was a professor um, in Belgium, in the Flemish-speaking part of Belgium. And Flemish is something that's very close to Dutch. So my parents just put me in a Flemish-speaking school. So I <laughs> was in an immersion environment um, as an American six-year-old having to figure things out. So I think that's, I mean, maybe that's part of where my interest in the, the process of learning of language and what ended up happening for me and my siblings um, during that year is that we learned very fast. We, you know, my parents just remarked about how two months in we sounded like native Flemish speakers. So I think I've always been fascinated with just that process and how our brains can handle language learning at a young age. Obviously, we don't have a chance to do kind of 24 7 immersion. We only see the students, you know, in junior kindergarten, we see them 15 minutes twice a week. So it's a lot less time than I had when I was in first grade. Anyway, to contrast, I could, I could go on for a long time. About this, but to contrast that with um, like the way I learned high school French. So I didn't, I didn't start taking French until I was in eighth grade. And the, the method that I learned high school French was a very grammar based method where we talked about, you know, what is a definite article and an indefinite article and masculine and feminine. And here's some regular verbs and irregular. And we sort of, it's like you're starting with little bits of language and you're adding to it. Whereas the way I learned Dutch as a child and the way I'm hoping to teach French to my students is sort of starting with a bigger piece of language with like a context, a whole language approach. So they encounter the language, they understand it, and then they can they can start communicating with it right away. And so it's, it's meaningful. It's not just these little bits that we're going to kind of string together eventually um, after we've kind of understood all the grammar and like the mechanics of the language. We, we, we just kind of encounter it and we bumble through until we're able to make that language our own. Um, so I think the way that the method came about was a lot through just experimentation. When I came into Avery Coonley 18 years ago, Denise, my colleague, had been here for 10 years already. And the program that I started with was very vocabulary-based in the younger grades. So the kids knew how to say a lot of different words. Like they could probably name 30 or 40 animals in French, but they couldn't talk meaningfully about the animals. They couldn't say, I like this animal or have this animal or I would like to have this animal or, or they couldn't talk in a meaningful way. So we wanted to just give them the tools to, to really be able to uh, take language structures like I have or I like, things that you'd say all the time, and be able to transfer them to different situations. So Denise and I, we would talk about it all the time, and <laughs> and then we would like, okay, well, let's just try things. And we, we came up with these dialogues, and we realized at, at, at first it was sort of like a supplement to the end of, it was like the end of the unit. We'd be like, okay, now that we've practiced vocab, you know, animal vocab a long time. Let's, let's talk about what animals we like. And I'm like, no, no, we need to put that at the beginning of the unit. Let's just introduce it in the context of what animal do you like? So yeah, and then we, I don't know, we just kept working on it and it evolved and it was a very fun process. It was kind of like when we wrote the curriculum, it was almost like there had been this like gestational period of all these ideas and experiments and stuff. And then when we went to actually turn it into a curriculum and a program, it just sort of like happened really fast. So yeah, strategies that I would recommend, especially for students who are coming in new and perhaps afraid of failure or, um, you know, feeling silly in front of the class, 
um, two things come to mind. First is um, I just try to do communication on the front end with the families of the new students to say there's going to be this adaptation period where, um, you know, you are going to come to my class. You are going to feel like you're in a foreign country for a little while. Um, but little by little, you're going to become more and more comfortable and it's going to take some time and there's grace in terms of the way I grade you. And, you know, I, you, I, I am just for that first trimester, I am just concerned that they are making an effort. So they have that kind of a grace period in terms of their, you know, their grade. Um, so that always sets them at ease for sure. Um, cause, um, our students can tend to be grade concerned, <laughs> um, you know, overall, my, my goal for all my classes is to create kind of a, a low stakes atmosphere where um, students are, are given them given the tools to practice the language. We do a lot of partner work. And in fact, my colleague, Denise Kleba and I wrote a curriculum together based on a series of partner conversations. So we have these kinds of slides set up where there's a, a short dialogue and then um, there's an underline, there might be an element of the dialogue that's underlined and then where you underline, you can replace it with various things. So they practice the dialogue over and over again and they can sort of change it as they go. So a, a very simple example would be a dialogue like, what kind of fruit do you like? I like bananas and then bananas would be underlined. And then at the bottom of the slide, they have images Images of different fruits and the words for them. So they could change that to, oh, I like apricots or I like pears, whatever, you know. So everything is right there for them. And, and that sort of is disarming because they can just, they can just practice. It's kind of like when you're practicing music, the music is in front of you and you are, you're looking at it. You don't have to know every single thing about it. You can, you can look back. So I think when new students jump into that curriculum, they can kind of start with any conversation and a lot of what they need is right in front of them. And then, you know, we also just try to make everything kind of light and fun. And those new students, they, they see the way their peers are interacting in French and how they're interacting with the curriculum. And, and they just kind of follow suit and they, they jump in. And um, I think it's really beautiful when, you know, a new student will get up and perform a little dialogue in front of the class for the first time. And the students who have been here for a while, they know what a risk that is. And they get this round of applause. We want to thank Jenny, Sarah, and Elizabeth for sharing their experiences with us. Hopefully you will find these episodes helpful as you try to shift your students' mindset from perfectionism towards the pursuit of excellence. And we'd like to thank you for joining us in this space today. Please subscribe to the Gifted Ed podcast to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Stay tuned for our next episode where Jenny, Sarah, and Elizabeth will be back with us to further explore perfectionism as we continue to unpack the complexities of giftedness.